All right, so with our spot illustration, I'm gonna start building this slowly. This was our final product as of the last videos. And what it is is black vector line work with flat color behind with duotone on top of it. Let's kind of build it from the bottom up, right? With color holds on top of that. And you can think of it as a sandwich. So what does a sandwich have to have on the bottom before you can color? It needs to have a piece of white bread, just a flat, clear white background. And I've locked that because I don't want to accidentally color on that background. I also make a duplicate with a gray background and with a black background, but that's just to see how versatile it is on different backgrounds because it's a spot illustration. For basic digital coloring, you want a flat white background. Then at the very top, you want your vector, your smart, your smart layer brought in EPS with your clean vector outline where everything's really clean. All right, so that makes the two pieces of bread for your sandwich. Black bread on top, that is locked. White bread on the bottom, that is locked. Now in between, let's build the sandwich on top of the white bread. The first thing we do is we put in flat color. Just one clean local color behind each different um, surface in our illustration. So vomiting water doesn't have clear local colors, right? Lots of blues. I also want to play with pinks and some yellows and some, some greenish turquoisey blues. But I just wanted to fill things in so I could adapt. Okay, then once you have that flat color in, then you can modify that with what's called duotones, splitting those tones up into darks and lights. And I did this almost randomly kind of cutting shapes with my lasso and changing them. And then I did it with soft edge colors. So the difference between duotone hard edge or cut edge is that that's a nice crisp delineation, like cell shading and animation. And soft edge is very soft in how it gradates from one to the other. So I have them both together here. And then I did another more exaggerated layer of the soft edge duotone to get that kind of transparency look to the water. So there's some hard edges in there, but a lot of the edges are soft and kind of glowing. Okay, and this is what it would look like with the black bread on top. Now, at any one of these stages, you could say you're finished. My coloring is done. All right. But I just wanted to show you all the different digital coloring tools you have. So that is a basic sandwich with black on top, white on the bottom, and color is in between, right? Like your jellies, your peanut butter. I like to add some little sprinkles. So I'll usually do one layer of white cutout highlights, right? That's like salting your sandwich. And then sometimes I'll do a little extra full bleed inking, these black shapes. That's like peppering your sandwich, right? But it still all goes underneath the black outline. So that's what all the stuff on the white bread looks like. Okay, now we're gonna talk about more special effects. And that's anything that goes above the black bread. You have a sandwich. If you have a sandwich, you have digital coloring, right? You can't have, a, can't have digital coloring with nothing between the bread, right? But you need to organize your color layers between those two slices of bread. A white blank layer at the bottom, black smart vector line work layer at the top. But if you want to make your sandwich extra fancy, you can put stuff above the black bread on the top. This is like putting a toothpick in the top with like an olive in it. And these are called color holds. Now color holds are simply when you replace the black line work with colored line work. So in this case, I replace it with a kind of bluish color. And that's painted over the top of the black lines. And it's gradated, so it just bites away at the top edge and at the bottom edge. Again, to give you that somewhat transparent, watery feel. Okay, then you can just keep building up on top. And I brought some of these uh, dissolved, textured, soft edge, duotone shadows up on top of my black line work. 
to fill it in a little bit and give me a little less computer generated looking color. And so that's where we finished up. This was kind of my finished illustration. And that was a good place to save. Now we can do even more to play with it before we make our poster, before we add type to it. Um, and the way we're gonna do that is with printing methods. So this is what I usually recommend. Once you've done all that, you want to turn off your background so you have nothing there. You want to crop it so that it's closer to the edges of your spot illustration. We're no longer worried about there being a whole poster of space around it. And we're going to save this as something else. And then what I'm going to do is say File, Save As. a spot illustration color separation test. And this is basically what your finished illustration, what would happen to it if you sent it to a professional printer. And I'm going to send it to the desktop just so I can play with it. Keep it as a PSD. Okay, so now I have my Assignment 7, Spot Illustration Color Separation Test, even though I spelled separation wrong. Now what I can do with the background turned off is I can go to Actions, because I have this all visible in the way I want. And I'm going to find Carl's Color Separation folder, open that up and go to CMYK full run. Now, an action is a built-in program, a list of commands, kind of pre-programmed in within Photoshop. And I've written this one. This is one I used whenever I was designing silkscreen t-shirts. And it's, it's served me well for a long time, using the Photoshop tools to separate out into four different inks, into cyan ink, magenta ink, yellow ink, and black ink, which is very different than the millions of colors we're seeing with now. So I just hit play. And I always create my actions to be safe, so they'll open up as new files. So it's going to create one new file that's just the cyan layer. And because I hadn't flattened or merged my layers before, it's going to ask me to merge them now, and I want to do that. So it doesn't just separate the colors from one layer, but from all of them, all the visible ones. So I now have a cyan file, a yellow file, a magenta file, a black file, and then one that is combined all the CMYK files combined. So if this was going to be a cheap, you know, vending machine sticker printed in the 80s, this is how it would be, would be printed. This is a new file. I did not overwrite my original, right? But what you have is blank white on the bottom, and then you have your cyan inks. Now it's all the same ink, 100%. It's just one color but it's broken up into what are called halftone dots. So the bigger the dot, the more blue will be in that part of the image. And they're set at a certain angle. So you'll notice each halftone dot screen is rotated at a slightly different angle so that when they're all combined, here's magenta now on top, they don't line up exactly with each other. That's why it's called offset printing. And for here, I can take the magenta and I can move it so it lines up exactly. Even though I've built in a jitter. And here's the yellow, and I can line that up exactly. But you see, they're not hitting on each other. They're creating what are called Gaussian roses. And then finally the black, which goes on the top. Now when the ink is printed, and I can line it up so it sits on it exactly. When the ink is printed, it often doesn't line up exactly, right? Because each screen is printed with one ink and they go really fast. So it's really kind of poor newspaper quality printing. You'll see the offsets happening a lot, which I kind of like, which are a little messier. Or you can choose, and I've built that jitter into the action, or you can choose to line them up as perfectly as you can, just with your arrow keys. <coughs> okay, I also make the dots really large. 
about 30 dots per inch instead of the, the printing capability of most um, offset lithography presses now, which is 300, at least 300 per inch. So this gives me a low res kind of vintage solution for printing when on the computer is this. But my big problem with computer illustration is that it looks very computer generated. And that's not often what I'm going for. I like to do things by hand. So this is a way of kind of messing with the, the printing. Now what I like to do, instead of saying that this is finished, because this has a lot of limitations, I like to then take all four of my ink layers, my black, my yellow, my magenta, my cyan, C-M-Y-K, and I put them into a folder. And then I move that folder out and I drag and drop it onto my original, right? Now, because mine is made for professional use, it's not set at 350 pixels per inch, it's set at 300 pixels per inch, which then allows me to grow it and try to line it up with my original. And again, you use the arrow keys, but it's gonna shift the whole group with the move tool and I can get that aligned. And honestly, I don't mind if it's a little bit off because I like, I like that offset. Yeah, so it's a tiny bit too small, so let me just hold down Shift, drag it a little bit more. On these sides, make sure it gets lined up as well as possible. Just so it's only messy where I want it to be messy. All right, that looks pretty good. Now this, this is weird. This is like I printed with millions of colors and then I went over the top of it and printed with first the cyan, then the magenta, then the yellow, and then the black. Now each of these inks are slightly lower opacity. So here the black's only at 80%. Here the yellow's at 45%. Here the magenta is at 66% and the blue is at 100% because it's the base layer. But what if I wanted to take that blue layer and I wanted to adjust, adjust it? So different ways you can adjust. I could give it a stroke. I can actually like outline all the blues with a little bit of white, just really tiny, to really just help them stand out a little bit more. Because one thing I noticed on my full digitally colored one, it doesn't feel a lot like water. It feels way more rainbow colored. So by using the halftone dots, this kind of makes it all watery. Problem is it's too strong. So now that I have this blue separated layer, I can also play with different ways of blending it in. For instance, using pin light or using soft light or using linear light, right? I can also play with the overall hue saturation of the blue. So maybe I don't want cyan so much. Maybe I want it to be more, you know, navy blue or more greenish. It's always worth playing with these things. Zero on hue is what you started with. So I like to push it both directions and see if one's more useful than the other. I can also brighten it or darken it. I can also intensify the color. It's already pretty intense. Maybe even knock down the color a little bit. So I'm liking that, darkening it a little bit, making it a little less intense. So now I've got all those beautiful halftone dots on my tongue, you know, kind of breaking it up in a more retro way than just the dissolve filter is doing. I can do a similar thing with just the magenta layer, but I just think that's too strong. I can do a similar thing with the yellow layer, 